Hey up everyone and welcome back to some more combat mission Black Sea. Uh, I'm going to be playing a meeting engagement against a Jarman G. He's going to be playing as the Russians and I'm going to be playing as the Americans but despite the fact that there's a very clear pecking order in Black Sea there's a very very distinct food chain so the Americans at the top and then the Russians in the middle and then the Ukrainians at the bottom but let's see if we can sidestep this by restricting the US forces to striker units or striker infantry. The striker is a interesting vehicle. It's kind of got its pros and its cons, shall we say, and it is a little bit divisive. Uh, in short, it's an eight-wheeled armoured vehicle. Armour being used in the loosest possible sense here. It's pretty much impervious to 14.5mm bullets, so that's a Dushka kind of sized calibre. And that's about it. It's very fast on-road. It's not amazing off-road. It does have some era plating or the ones uh, in Combat Mission Black Sea have some explosive reactive armor plating on uh, which may or may not help against RPGs and shaped charge warheads but I'm not really inclined to test that uh, and find out how bad they are at least not in this battle so essentially almost all of the advantages of the striker as a vehicle are not tactical advantages, shall we say. It's strategically mobile, it doesn't need a lot of maintenance compared to tracked vehicles, that kind of thing. In Iraq they'd routinely drive for very long distances to get from point A to point B uh, with considerably less fuss than say moving a Bradley unit. Uh, they're also easier to air transport, they're you know, it can fit in the back of a couple of large transport aircraft. And the idea is that the Striker Brigade is going to be a bit tougher than an airborne light infantry unit, uh, but at the same time can get onto the ground, can get to some kind of crisis point quite quickly or faster than the heavy stuff. Uh, and that's all well and good until you actually have to fight something in the strikers. Uh, because they are essentially battle taxis. Uh, the important thing is not to get distracted by the fact that they have a, a variety of variants and uh, weapon systems on them. It's a taxi. And if it's fighting, then something has probably gone wrong somewhere. Uh, another way to look at it would be as a light infantry delivery system. So that's a pretty severe handicap here, to put it lightly, uh, given that uh, a Jarman G doesn't have any restrictions uh, on what he can take. He could be taking, uh, he could bring along a, um, it's a medium battle, I think he could just about afford to bring along a, uh, a tank company and some other bits and bobs, that kind of thing. So that's a lot of firepower, a lot of combat power, which I might struggle to deal with, which of course is what's going to make this interesting. Now this is the map that we're going to be fighting over. I've got three deployment zones. I've got two over on the right side here, and then I've got this one down here. And uh, Ajamaji has some corresponding ones. He's got uh, one in this valley here, uh, one down here in this little bit of reverse slope and then one in this corner up here on the reverse slope behind this great big wheat field. Uh, the map's about 1600 by 1600 meters so about a kilometer and a half square. We've got these two objectives to fight over. I shall turn them back on. We've got one which is in this uh, in and around the town of uh, Chikalivka. I'm probably massacring that pronunciation. But at least I can pronounce it, I suppose. Uh, and that's essentially, it's a hollow objective. It's 
uh, based on the road network, pretty much. Uh, so we've got some of the main roads in the town, in Chigalifka, or the village, uh, and then comes down here to this bridge and this bridge. So the river is mostly non-fordable. So it is a significant obstacle. Uh, in some areas, we like here, you can just about see under the surface of the water, we've got some deep fords, so vehicles can't cross those, but infantry can. Uh, past here, it becomes uh, less of an obstacle, uh, becomes a lot shallower. We've got this kind of marshland around here where these two streams are joining. And we've got one arm that goes up around uh, this side and the other one on this side and in between them we have this big ridge line uh, which is going to be very important in this battle uh, and here where the road comes through we have a cut in the ridge line we have a, uh, a bit of a, a defile and out on this side we have rolling farmland very flat very nasty um, we have a bit of higher ground uh, in this corner and then uh, also where we have this valley or cutting here for the uh, for the road going into the village. That's uh, Jarman G's side of the map. Over on my side it's kind of just rolling open terrain. A lot of open ground mixed up with a bit of forest. Uh, do have some reverse slope to play with which is going to be uh, the lifesaver here because we don't want anything to get spotted because it's just going to die. So, looking at the map, what kind of points do we want to control? Well, I'm going to have to be pretty aggressive here. I need to avoid attacking at all costs because I'm just not going to be able to do it. What I want to do is I want to rush up as fast as possible, get into position, seize some of the dominant terrain, and then dig in, use the reverse slopes to move around without getting spotted, and force a G to come to me and try and clear me out, uh, at which point we're going to destroy him, mostly with artillery. So, obviously we want to be controlling this ridge line. Uh, we can have some hull down positions for the strikers, perhaps on top, if we're crazy enough to find uh, to get them to shoot at something. We can lay some ambushes to cover these uh, gaps. Uh, the gap up here. Maybe, if we can, even push some infantry down into the stream and f get into this uh, tree line here. Just so he's got, we've got a bit of depth to work with. Uh, but mostly we're going to be playing about on the reverse slope up here. Observers and uh, a screen up in front so we can see what's going on on the other side. And then um, application of firepower. So we definitely want to control the ridge, we want to be controlling this valley here, it's an obvious choke point. Over on this side, it's going to be worth having a um, something covering down the stream here, in case a Jarman G manages to cross it. We want to have uh, an MG or a striker or something covering down there. And then, of course, we've got uh, this bridge and the other bridge. We also want to be controlling them. The river isn't as much as an obstacle for a Jarman G as it is for me. Strikers aren't amphibious, but almost everything the Russians can bring along is. So this is less of an obstacle uh, for one of us than it is for the other, and that's going to need uh, some serious thinking about. As for the town, I don't want to get involved in, in a fight in the town uh, at all. We're just going to stay out of it. If we see anything in there, we can RT the snot out of it. Uh, but it's going to be really important to control this kind of area here over on this side. Firstly, because it's probably the only reliable way of controlling... Uh, but, but if the bulk of my force is going to be over on this side, 
Uh, probably in this kind of area here, we got it bounded by this tree line and the ridge line there. Uh, this tree line is going to be a good uh, depth position because we can have this great big open field to cover and we're going to be able to dominate that fairly easily, I would have thought, with some hull down strikers, javelin teams, that kind of thing. Uh, but that's going to leave this entire area over here completely open and of, this is all in uh, defilade so if uh, a German G pushes up here and he has some uh, BTRs or BMPs they can swim the river come across this way and then we've got some problems because he's going to be able to get round behind us uh, another reason why this area is going to be important is because it's in his face and having done a little bit of testing a striker one of the few advantages a striker has is that it's very fast on roads. So a striker bombing down this road at full speed can get across the river and into this kind of area on turn one. Whether it's going to survive if uh, a Jarman G also bum rushes something up here to try and cover uh, down the main road like this, there's a good kind of keyhole going on there. It's a different question. Uh, but chances are uh, that if we have something, or I have rather, if I have something up here, hull down, or in this little dip here, covering the same area, we're probably going to be able to get the drop at him simply because I'm going to be able to get into position first. So. So there is going to be an unfortunate kind of bait slash suicide team who are going to be uh, doing this bum rush, getting down here and setting themselves up in these buildings where we can cover this side of the town, generally be a nuisance and f force the enemy to react to us. And we want to kind of get him, in, get it up in his face and make him come after us. Not too bothered about casualties here, because uh, we're going to be sending just a fairly small force up this way. It doesn't need to be major. We just need to get in his face. And then um, in combination uh, with that and then some TRPs, uh, target reference points uh, in these trees here and in the city, in the city, in the village, uh, that kind of area. What we want to do is bait him in as well. So... He's not going to be able to ignore a position here, and that means he's going to have to go after us. And when he does, we're going to arty the snot out of him. So arty is going to be the real killing instrument here. I did play about with uh, F-15s. I can af pretty much afford to take a two, one or two F-15s. They come with uh, five 1,000 pound bombs each, but Russian AA uh, the Russians take their anti-aircraft fire very, very seriously. Uh, right down to the tactical level in something like Combat Mission Black Sea, you have uh, IGLA man pads, yeah, man portable AA systems, and uh, everybody's favourite, the Tunguska uh, self-propelled AA vehicle. And in all the tests I've done here, when the F-15s turn up, they get shot down instantly. They never even uh, get to drop a bomb. Um, so it's it's entirely sensible, very predictable that Jarman G is going to have at least one Tunguska and that's pretty much just going to shut down the entire aerial flank as it were. So as much as I would love to have a uh, thousand pound bombs dropping all over the place over here, I can't do it because it's just not worth the points expenditure. Uh, it's about a thousand points out of eight thousand five hundred. 1,200? Yeah, 1,200 points for an F-15 uh, that can get shot down by uh, a guy with an Igla who costs about less than 100 points. So it's just not worth it. It's not going to be cost effective. I'm going to get a lot more bang for my buck with artillery. So that's uh, the broad scope of the plan. What am I expecting a Jarman G to do? Well... I'm expecting him to get up onto the high ground uh, with some 
weapons teams, with observers, with tanks perhaps and really try and just generally get the fire out and dominate the place so that he has that freedom to move up. I am increasingly worried now that I'm thinking about it about this river line and his ability to cross it whereas I can't uh, because obviously uh, the ridge line here we've got a great big cliff we've got uh, marshland which is kind of bad for the, the vehicles but down here he's got to come across a great big well he's got this big orchard here I suppose but coming out of this deployment zone in this corner he's got to cross a gigantic wheat field and get up across the railway line through the trees across the river and up the slope up the uh, the saddle here uh, all the while he's potentially going to be being, being eyeballed by my forces up here so I do sort of expect him to try and avoid the ridge as a hard point unless he really goes for it because if he does rush and he gets uh, in the reverse slope down here we could end up with a kind of messy stalemate um, uh, and the thing just dis degenerating into an artillery duel we're going to try and avoid that. I am kind of expecting him to push uh, and try and seize a position because it's he it has such a tremendous advantage. I would expect him to go after the strikers, especially in the early phase. He knows the way I play the game. I like to get into position really fast, so I'm expecting him to push as well. And if he pushes tanks against strikers, the strikers are going to lose. And lose really, really badly. So, that's a kind of broad o overview of the map. Um, we're going to hop out. This is in the preview. Uh, oh, before I go, incidentally. The conditions are, the wind's gentle, it's from the west. Uh, the ground's dry, it's warm, everything's clear. There's no electronic warfare going on, anything like that. So smoke and dust are going to hang around. Not that that's a massive issue because everyone's got bleeding thermal sites. So here we go. We can just about afford a... No, that's the Bradley one. We don't want that. The Rifle Company Striker here. So we're going to pick that. That's the bulk of our points here. So we've got the HQ Company. Headquarters XO, the fire support team, and then uh, some the strikers that go along with them. We've got a sniper team, we don't want the sniper team, we don't want the sniper team's Humvee. Uh, that's the fire support vehicle, we want that. Uh, these two strikers. Uh, the strikers have a choice between having the Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher, or grenade machine gun, and the, the 50 caliber machine gun, the HMG. Uh, and we're pretty much going for the 50 cal here because the uh, I like the Mark 19, but I don't think I'm going to get the bang for buck out of it. Uh, this is all about picking the right uh, right equipment. I think that the 50 cal is going to be a lot more accurate, a lot more accurate, and a lot more effective. So we've got uh, the company HQ. Uh, each platoon has got uh, uh, three squads, uh, a weapon squad, which is two uh, M240 MMGs or GPMGs. Then it's got uh, an FO team, a fire support team, and four strikers. All of the strikers have got Javelin uh, ATGMs in them uh, with three missiles each. Or oh, each of the rifle squads, rather, has one they're going to be uh, the most useful thing we've got everybody else is going to be uh, all the other people in the squad are going to be there to help the javelin guy out so we've got those three platoons that's our major point sink and I'm going to need those boots uh, boots on the ground to get things done and we're just gonna there's a variety of motivation and
you know, experience, motivation, and, and leadership values, because it's basically just picked a typical kind of, you know, I'm going to be tweaking them a little bit later on. Uh, next, we've got a mortar section, and that's got two 120mm uh, mortars, so it's actually a lot cheaper. You can see what we're on now, 3352. If I have off map of mortars, I get another, you know, a few hundred points out of that. Uh, but we're going to totally get away or get rid of this team. This is going to be our suicide um, force bum rush. We're going to be seizing the um, the crossing over, over on our left flank, so we're going to rename it the A team because we expect them to run around and shoot at everything. Uh, just so it's not called a mortar platoon because that just weirds me out a little bit. I'm going to make sure we've got them on uh, veteran, high motivation, and uh, leadership's not that big a deal. And I'm going to stick a couple of javelin teams, a couple of scout teams, and a couple of saw teams. So we kind of basically made sort of two cut down rifle squads, and then we're going to give them uh, some strikers so they can get forward. So that's a nice, you know, 731 points. Pretty hard-hitting little uh, expendable team there. The drone, uh, each company comes with a drone. It's going to get shot down pretty much quickly. Uh, almost instantly, probably. Uh, it's 400 points. I'm going to be able to use that 400 points on something else. So, I, yeah. Drones are amazing. But at the same time, I need to get, uh, at the moment I'd rather have more useful things. Now to round it off, uh, we're going to get a few uh, mobile gun system strikers, or the M1128s. And these are... Strikers with a 105mm gun mounted on top. That's a very, very effective piece of kit. I think it's the old Royal Ordnance one, is actually. The ones that used to be on Abrams before they upgraded to the 120mm uh, smoothbore. Uh, they don't carry a lot of ammunition, but it's the closest thing I've got to an actual tank. So, we're going to be having a few of those. Top of that, let's get the artillery sorted out. So, here we go. Three times 155mm self propelled howitzers. That's the, the Paladins. 771 points. And we can actually cut that down even more by making them just regular. Uh, they have a metric ton of ammunition, which is what we really want here, because we're going to be using these a lot. And uh, because of the, just the, the sheer integrated nature and uh, the fact that anyone can call for support, the radios, the uh, all the digitization and the linkage and things, the Americans can call in this artillery extremely quickly, uh, whereas in other games, uh, in the World War II titles, or if you're not playing as the Americans, if you're playing as the Russians or the Ukrainians, it takes a long time to call in artillery. It takes uh, 10 minutes, sometimes more. The fire support team, uh, when they're sat in their fire support vehicle and the striker, which is all networked and everything, can call in. Uh, a 155 barrage in about two to three minutes. It's extremely fast, very reactive, and we're going to be using them a lot. And then, just to make it even better, we're going to have a load of target reference points as well. So, a target reference point is a, uh, a pre-known location. It's a registered target, so instead of uh, having to go through all the spotting 
and things for the artillery fire. There's no need for correction at all. You just ring up the battery and say, I want you to bomb point A or point B. And they do it. Makes it much faster, much more accurate. More importantly, there is no warning. Uh, the shells just drop in. There's no kind of... Uh, no kind of spotting rounds or anything to give the game away. It just all comes in and kills everybody. And that's really what we want. We don't need any crack units. There's a lot of stuff uh, when you pick the typical typical quality Americans, they factored in a lot of, uh, well, veterans, I suppose, uh, like Iraq War and... You don't need high motivation. A lot of Iraq War and Afghanistan veterans. Uh, and you compare, uh, when you combine that with the kind of professional uh, volunteer army, uh, that you get in the West, which is very, very different from the kind of system you have in uh, Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, that really, really adds up. Uh, there is a huge difference in quality. So we're just uh, making some of the, uh, the mobile gun systems crack, just so that they're a little bit extra, because uh, they need to be on the board. And that should round it out. What have I forgotten? Ah! You're going back down to veteran, because I need some... I need some, where are I? Some air defense because whereas the Russians are all like, oh, air defense, let's do that. The Americans are a lot more, uh, the Air Force will do it for us. So now I need to trim out uh, 150 points somewhere just so I have. Uh, This is basically, um, so it's like 49, ah, come on, we could cut a striker out. Oh, hang on, we just set everything to veteran, to regular, don't we? Yeah, now everything's veteran, that's a bit better. Evened it out a bit. We could cut out the Exo's striker. I'm not sure he's going to need it. Yeah, if we cut out the Exo striker. We're going to have enough for a little manpower platoon, just in case. I should do the trick. 
So we've got a Humvee with Stinger ammo, two Stinger teams. Uh, we're just going to sit them up in a corner on the reverse slope where no one's going to shoot at them. And they should be okay. Let's just uh, pop up some of the uh, the platoon leaders. Pop up their leadership a bit so that they're going to be able to communicate a little bit better. Uh, these things really add up. Then, uh, now nah, we can't can't bump those guys up anymore, unfortunately. Nah. Okay, so we've got two points left over. That's probably the best that we're going to get. Let's press go! So we press OK, and then that's going to generate the file. Uh, I shouldn't be the plane. Yeah, so we're going to send this back off to a Jarman G. Uh, I've done my pick, then he has to do his picks and his deployment in one go. Then after that, I do my deployment, press go, and then we're getting stuck in. So, yeah, we'll see what kind of disaster this turns into.